The first few minutes of the session audio were not recorded. During this time, the session chair introduced David Canfield Smith, who was a member of the original STAR user interface design team, and Dave Kerbo, who joined the team uh, after the first release. During his introductory remarks, David thanked those that helped him put together the hardware and software for this demonstration. We pick up the audio just a couple of minutes later. So, Star was a personal computer that we designed for office professionals, which at the time, in the mid-70s, meant secretaries and staff members. It did not mean managers or executives because the conventional wisdom of the time was that managers don't type. Boy, this is, the world has really changed since those days. <laughs> well, I'm gonna to try to be forthright here and talk about the strengths and the weaknesses of STAR. Um, there were strong ones on both sides. So a strength was that it really was a breakthrough product which made a huge improvement in computer usability by non-computer professionals. Why don't you put up this slide? So here is a few of the, the first that Star pioneered. It was the first um, visual point-and-click interface. In fact, the term direct manipulation came from Star. Or, I mean, Ben, ben Schneiderman publicized it, but I'm, this was the first system to illustrate it. It was the first use of icons of the desktop metaphor. It was the first system to identify and follow what have become since standard human computer interface principles. It was the first object-oriented interface. It was the first uh, use of the uh, commercial use of the Ethernet. And it was the first use of a network laser printer. So that's also a weakness, however. Star tried to do too many new things. It did some well and some poorly. And really, it had to do everything well if it was going to be an economic success, which it wasn't. So Star, Xerox built Star from the ground up. If you look on the left here, it built custom hardware. Remember, there were no microprocessors then. It built Ethernet hardware and transceivers and all that, cabling. It built a custom bitmap display, a custom keyboard, and even a mouse, since there were very few mouse vendors back then. We didn't invent the mouse, of course. We know from our previous talk that Doug Engelbart did. Um, and on the right there, we uh, invented our own programming language to program all this in, Mesa, which is very like Java, and it was a byte-coded uh, language. So we wrote microcode for the hardware to interpret the bytecodes. We wrote our own operating system pilot. We wrote our own network services, like mail, print servers, file servers. We wrote a development environment for all this called Tahoe. We wrote the first user interface management system ever, which actually is what the Star Desktop was. And we wrote all of the applications. So that was, that was the killer weakness of Star, uh, actually, is that it was a closed system. And um, we thought we could build all the applications. There was no provision for third-party applications. And that was a fatal error. The Lisa toolbox, which you're going to hear about next, was a big improvement over Star. Okay, so let's look at the um, hardware a little bit here. I've actually got some uh, museum pieces for you. Here is one of the boards from the original Star. There were five, five, six, five or six of these. This is actually the processor board. And here you can see the 2901 bit slice processor. Now, what a bit slice processor is, it had a four bit ALU on it. So if you wanted, um, say, a 16-bit word, you just chain four of them together, and you have the 16-bit processor. Here is a memory board. Any guesses as how much memory this holds? <laughs> One meg. That's a good guess. Any other guesses? 64K. <laughs> this um, holds half a megabyte. It uses... Um, 16 kilobit chips. And the interesting thing there to note is that the memory density has increased by a factor of 10,000. 
usually one order of magnitude makes a qualitative difference, and this is four orders of magnitude we have today. Um, we had a large two-page display because the marketing requirement was that we we'd be able to show two pieces of paper side by side in full size. We had a two-button mouse, which you can see down there. Uh, our user testing showed that we should have two buttons uh, because one wasn't enough and three wasn't necessary. Um, the Mac, it's a little known fact that the Mac also has two buttons, but the second button's on the keyboard. We have a custom keyboard. Actually, here's the actual keyboard. You won't be able to see it too well here, but you can come up and look at it later. You can also see it there. It's got three groups of function keys. They're dedicated keys with hard labels on them, and a, ty a standard typing array. Um, this group here was an interesting one. Depending on the context of the selection, these would be remapped into other meanings. So these were virtual keys. The hard the labels all had to do with text, like bold, italic, and underline, and superscript. Uh, but they would be remapped as needed. But it's the left group of function keys that were really the important one. Here's a picture of it, uh, especially those ones on the right there, delete, copy, move, and show properties. Those were the key, the four key commands in star. And in fact, as I do the demo in a minute here, those are basically all the commands I'm going to be using. As I say, it was on the left side of the keyboard. So the way you worked was, following Engelbart's lead, you put your left hand on these keys and your right hand on the mouse, and you could operate star for quite a while without ever going to the main typing array. There were no command, control, or alt keys, or any modifier like that. And next slide. Is, let's see, what is the next slide anyway? But the next slide is my cue. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is log on, and you had to log on to Star because it was networked from the day from day one. Wait a second. Here. Uh, so you had to identify yourself to the system, but then you only had to log on once, not once to each server that you went to. Uh, from then on, they would negotiate with the servers behind the scenes. Now, the first thing I'd like you to notice is that there's no menu bar at the top of the screen. That is not a menu bar. <laughs> you will see them in a moment. Uh, that's a message area for prompts and feedback. Way over here on the right, there is a single pull-down menu that has a few commands that we didn't have time to get rid of. Uh, plus in session, which we actually wanted. Down here in the lower right corner is a single icon. I'm going to pretend today to be a new user, first just first encountering Star. And the first thing I'll do is I'll set up kind of a working environment, and then I'll do a little document editing. This directory icon is your handle onto the network. So I'll open it up. And so I select it and use the open key. Um, there's the first key uh, command I've used. And uh, now, again, I want you to look at this window. It's got a couple of buttons in it. This is still not a menu bar. <laughs> it has almost no commands in it, is the point. And you'll, it'll be even more striking when we go to the document window. OK, well, I want to set up my, I want to get some resources here. So I'll open this thing. Let's see, desktop. OK, that's promising. I'll see what's in there. All right, so here's some stuff. I'll get a blank document and folder. And now I'm going to push the copy key. And I'm, the cursor changes to an arrow. I'm going to put, it, put those things out here on my desktop. So I've just copied them out. And I'm going to move this one down to here using the Move key. And I'm going to copy out another document here and put it right next door. We'll use that in a minute. OK, and then back over here in our window, uh, let's see what else we got. Well, local devices. Hmm. Oh, floppy drive. OK, I want one of those. By the way, if you're wondering what this thing on top here is, this is the floppy drive. And some of you may not even know what, how it got named floppy disk, since they're rigid as a board. Uh, that thing was very floppy. It was a five and a quarter inch floppy, and it would really bend back and forth. 
Hey, there's floppies. See, this is this is progress, folks. <laughs> Let's see, uh, office accessories. Uh, oh, a clock. Okay, we'll get a clock out here. So I'll copy that out. Here's kind of an interesting icon. Um, this is a dynamic icon that changed its shape to show the time. So that's kind of fun. All right, what else we got here? Let's see. Oops, I didn't mean to close it all the way. Um, let's see what's in the desktop divider. Oh, okay, in and out baskets. That's for email. So I'll uh, copy those out. And what other resources have we got available to us? Here's the network. Now here is um, where the network shows up, the network organization. If there were other companies or universities or organizations on the network, they would show up in their own little folders here. Um, the only one that's here is Xerox, so we'll open it up. And these are different geographical regions within Xerox. Dallas, Japan. This is Palo Alto, so I'll open that up. And it has some filing and mailing resources. Okay, so since this is my region, I'll see what those are all about. Here are all the file servers that are available to me, and somebody has named them like universities. Okay, that's good. And okay, um, here's a file drawer. And let's see, um, hmm, I think I might want that. Let me just peek inside and see. Yeah, final Kai slide. I'm probably going to want that. So copy that out. In fact, I think uh, just in general, I better have this whole file drawer. So I'm going to copy this whole file drawer out. Now, what that does is it makes an alias. It doesn't do a total copy of the thing. It's just a pointer. And actually, the icon is subtly different. You might notice that this one and this one are grayed out a little bit, which means they're aliases. All right, and uh, I'm just about done here with everything I need. What have we got here? Printing. Oh, yeah, i got to be able to print, so I'll, I'll get a couple of printers. And I'm still just using the copy key. Put those out. And I think I'm pretty much done, except I may want to come back someday and get more resources. So I'm going to copy out my whole little handle onto this geographic set of resources. And while I'm at it, I... I deal with the Dallas people a lot, so I'm going to copy out their resources. A strength of STAR was that it treated remote and local resources the same. It was no harder to use remote ones than local ones. So I could take a document that was on a file server in London and print it on a printer in Japan just by using, just by moving it to the printer, the same way I would do with a local document, a local printer. So if we look back, step back a second here and take a look at this screen, here's what we've set up so far. We uh, got a little clock, kind of cute. We've got a few documents, a blank folder, just in case we need one, copy disk drive, in and out mail baskets. Oh, and this one even announces I have some mail. Uh, file drawer, a couple of printers, and a couple of um, handles and some resources in these locations. I could put any more number of other things on. So now I'm going to switch. Let's just take a look here. Um, one thing I did want to point out here, I'm going to try to illustrate how we got by with so few commands as we go through the demo. One point is already um, possible here. Uh, you move a document around by selecting it and then pushing the move key and a little miniature picture of the document appears in the cursor. I don't know if you can see that too well or not. This is our version of drag and drop. So you tell it whether you're going to do a move or a copy to the thing and then it allows you to drag it. And now you just click on some icon and it will deposit it there. Uh, so if you move to a printer, it's the print command. If you move to a file drawer, it's the store it command. If you move it out of a file drawer, it's the retrieve command. If you move to an outbox, it's send mail. Move it out of an inbox, it's receive mail. If you move it to converter, it's convert the format command, and so on and so on. So you can do a hell of a lot of commands with that one generic command. So I'm going to make a copy of this and start editing the copy. And I'll say open to it. And now we're inside the document editor. 
A uh, few things to note here. First, this is still not a menu bar. <laughs> There's one command here. Uh, actually, it's interesting. I hadn't seen this. In my version of star, there were eight little buttons in the window. And in the second version, it got reduced to one. So the, so kudos to whoever was responsible for this. Now, how many times have you seen version two have fewer commands than version one? <laughs> Uh, it's got one button here, close, and then nothing for a while. And then over here on the right, where we kind of hope you won't notice them, are some pull-down menus. And they've got a few little system commands, and I don't want you to read these. Here's some table and field commands. Here's some commands dealing with the window as a whole. And here's a command for dealing with the electronic mail. All right. So um, also notice that there's no quit command. Is just closed. There was no quitting or launching of applications. You just page them in and out of virtual memory. Let's see. Okay, so let's type some text here. All right, now I'm going to select this text and say show properties. This is where I'm using one of these powerful um, commands. And up comes something called a property sheet. Star was an object-oriented interface. Everything was an object. The character was an object. A paragraph was an object. A graphic line or a document was an object. And every object had attributes. You could see and manipulate those attributes through the thing called a property sheet. So here's the one for paragraphs. And I can do things like, say, make it centered and maybe double height and uh, space before. I'm going to give him triple height. And let's go to the um, character properties here. Yes, yeah, so I just hit the props key. Character, let's see, we'll change the font to serif and make it big and bold and italic. And then I'm going to click this little ap apply button. And it's going to apply those properties to the selection. Apply is kind of interesting because what it does, it applies the changes and leaves the property sheet up. That kind of changes the nature of property sheets into essentially a control panel. You can now make additional selections and then just set some properties and say apply and continue to uh, interact with text that way. Okay, so let's type some more text. All right, well, this, uh, let's see, I, gee, I don't want this quite so big. It's really dominating things now. Now, I could bring up the property sheet again, but, you know, one criticism we've actually heard is that, oh, gee, you can't use property sheets because they're too slow. Well, we have some accelerators. That's what the top row of function keys are all about. So I can make this thing non-italic just by pushing, um, basically, shift italic. Shift means not. So, and let's see, I want it not centered. And I even want a smaller and a smaller font. OK, that's the way I want it. So uh, for the high frequency things, you can come up with accelerators. That's what we're all good at here, is designing clever accelerators. All right, well, so already we're a little bit ahead of what the state of the art was. We have multi-font text in a what you see is what you get type fashion. Now I want to show you how we get non-textual things in. So I'm going to use uh, another one of our, what I think is a powerful idea, the virtual keyboard. So I'm pushing down the keyboard key on the keyboard. So try to say that. And um, it's remapping the top row of function keys. And I can see what the virtual keyboard is by saying uh, show it. And it will show me the virtual keyboard mapping here. And right now you see it's mapped into the ASCII set, but I can change it to office symbols, or math symbols, or logic, or Greek, or Russian. Or I can even make it in the Dvorak keyboard layout if you'd like to try typing like that. But what I want to do is show you our special characters. These are non-graphical things. So here we have a, uh, a graphics frame and a text frame, a field, an equation, a button, and some other stuff. Well, what I want is a graphics frame. 
we do on climb by the way? Alright, now um, I'm going to move this out of the way so I can see. Now when I select this graphics frame, it's going to remap the top row of function keys again into graphical meanings, like stretch and magnify. So I'm going to say stretch, and now I can stretch this, this thing around, get the size I want it. And now I'm going to show you how we used the copy key and how um, it changed the way you, you worked in a way that I think is a lot simpler for, for many people. Uh, here, I just opened this document that I copied out earlier called the Basic Graphics Transfer Sheet. This is something that was modeled after the rub-off sheets of the time. And a rub-off sheet was a transparent sheet that you would put down, full of symbols, that you would put down on a typewritten page, and then you take your eraser and rub off the back of one of those symbols, and it would transfer the symbol to the page. But well, we don't have to be quite so primitive. Um, we can actually use the copy command. But here is a rub-off sheet that someone has created, and it's got some simple graphics things on it. I'll take this oval and say copy and put it up here. And then maybe I'll stretch it, stretch it out. And uh, OK. And now uh, maybe I'll move it a little bit to sort of get centered. All right, good. If I look down in this um, transfer sheet, gee, I can see that there's some other stuff here. In addition to the simple graphics, it's a little bit more sophisticated. There's a pie chart and a line graph and a bar chart, but I interact with it in exactly the same way. I just select it and say copy, and I can position it now, and I can stretch it. All right. Now it's an object like everything else, so it has its own property sheet. When I bring up the bar chart property sheet, you can see it has bar chart-like things, like a, the axis, how I want it to look, how I want the bars to look, and the spacing, and whether I want a key. It's even got a table of data. So I'll actually uh, type in some data here. I'll do a little demographics on Dave Perbo and me. Can you guys see this, or is this uh, in invisible? Now, to get from field to field, I'm hitting the next key. That's another key that I'm using here. And the next key proceeds through the fields of structured objects. So in a table case, it's through the rows and columns of a table. So let's see. I'll, say, I'll start with height. And Dave's about, uh, oh, shall we say, uh, 75 inches. And I'm about, shall we say, uh, 72. And uh, now we'll get fanciful. Uh, say Dave's about 120, the charitable and I'll say I'm about 150. Now, um, let's see what this data looks like when we plot it. So I hit the apply key button, and it will plot that data in the bar chart. And that's not bad, that's pretty much okay with me, except um, this one bar is kind of beating a little bit. So I'm going to go change the appearance of that bar to be black. Try to make the image look a little more stable. Oops, I changed the wrong one. All right, that one we want to be that way, and this one we want to be that way. Try that. OK. All right, so I'm done with this little picture. Um, let's, let me insert some other kind of stuff in here. I'm going to use my special uh, keyboard again to insert an equation frame. And when I do that, um, it inserts a frame and sticks the carrot in there. And now it's got its own special keyboard that has equation-like objects in it, like products, sums, and integrals. So what I want is a summation here. And we can see up there that it has put the caret in the lower limit of the summation. This is a, now a structured object. So I can type, uh, say, i equals 1 to 100. Uh, notice that, if you can see, if we can zoom in a little bit on this. That's it. Um, the i is in italic, the letters are in italic, and the number is in non-italic, which is proper mathematical formatting. Now I'm going to hit the next key, and that's going to take me to the upper limit. 
and I can type 100, again in non-italic, and then hit the next key and it takes me to the right side, and I can type something like a fraction, and in the interest of um, simplicity, I'm just going to type some stuff and then maybe plus some other stuff, and then when I hit the next key, it'll go to the denominator and type some more stuff. I don't want to spend a long time here, but the point is that there is um, a structured object, and I can m move through the structure just hitting one command. I do want to stick in a limit, though. And I'd like to say here, the limit is i goes to infinity. Well, if I look at my special equation keyboard, I see that there's no arrow. So, but maybe my math keyboard has it. Oh, yeah, there's something. It's just what I need. In fact, it's even got an infinity symbol. So from this character set, I can get those things, and then I can type something. Ah, you may notice up here it said document backup in progress. It was actually doing an automatic save there. Uh, it would save itself periodically so you didn't lose anything if the machine crashed. Okay, that's enough of this. Let's go on to... Um, oh, gee, this is taking longer than I thought. Um, okay, I was going to insert some fields into this document, uh, but I would do it the same way, using the special key. And fields are objects that have their own field properties that allow you to name data so that you can then use a document as a form to be, um, to be, uh, as a form output interface to a database or something like that. But I would like to uh, just sort of uh, clean this document a little, up a little bit. So I asked it to repaginate itself. Here is one of the weaknesses of STAR. It was so underpowered, it was basically the equivalent of a Mac Plus in power. It was so underpowered that we had to give up on some um, interact interactivity and uh, so we couldn't keep it up to date according to, uh, you know, in real time. So unfortunately, we had to have a paginate command. But here's the document that I've been creating. Now, I've done this only using the copy, move, show properties, and next commands, and the keyboard, the virtual keyboard. So let me sort of wrap up here. This is a multimedia document. I could have put in a bunch more stuff, but I wouldn't have used many more commands than what you saw. These are all live bits, by the way. I can go back and edit them at any time. I don't have to launch an application to edit them. So I'm just going to close this thing, and then we'll move it to um, our out basket. And we'll mail it, which shows the uh, icon paradigm. So that's all it takes to mail something. It's not like you have to launch another application and then do an attachment of a document. You just drag it to the out basket. Okay, so to wrap up, there's a couple of lessons that it might bear thinking about, even today. Star had very few commands, and it achieved this through its pervasive use of generic function keys that were used everywhere, rigorously. Objects that had property sheets, the virtual keyboard, smart objects, like those equation objects that you could just next your way through, all of those things reduced the number of commands it took to accomplish tasks. Um, we had a taxonomy of icons, data icons, and function icons. And the function icons would operate on the data icons. So when I dragged that document to the out basket, the out basket mailed it. And finally, the copy paradigm provided real support for both novice and expert users. And it was an extensible mechanism. You could create your own, for example, transfer sheets with the own objects that you like to um, manipulate. 
If you'd like more information, Dave Kerbel has created a, an unofficial website here that uh, has a few interesting artifacts on it. Feel free to take a look. Uh, Jeff Johnson has written a nice paper on STAR called the Xerox STAR Retrospective. And there's a couple papers cited in the summary. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dave. So it really is quite impressive to see what a uh, Herculean feat that you, <laughs> you managed to do so long ago. Um, it's not really fair because we started a bit late. Um, and so let's try, we have time for a few questions. There's a microphone in the aisle here, so uh, if we can be as efficient as we can about this, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be able to get through a few at least. Hi, that was, that was a great demo, thanks. Uh, <laughs> hey. I was just wondering if you had an undo feature, an, an undo key somewhere there. I don't there. think the mic is on. <laughs> did, did you have an undo feature, an undo key? Undo. There was even oh key. dear, how embarrassing. Yes, we had a key on the keyboard labeled undo. Right there for all the world I can to verify see. it. It says undo. <laughs> it was never implemented. <laughs> <laughs> How embarrassing. Uh, we used to go through the star functional specification and try to find the single sentence that required the most implementation work. And it was a pretty easy task, actually. It was a sentence that said, every command can be undone by pushing the undo key. <laughs> Next question. Well, hi, I'm, I'm Dave Unger from Sun. And uh, Jay, I don't know which question to ask. I'll pick one at random. Uh, you have a lot of, you have a stationary and copying is the metaphor and in the programming language area we found there was this interesting problem called the corrupted prototype problem where you inadvertently changed the prototypical thing and then you never know why is my world so messed up was there anything analogous like this uh, that you saw or did you do something about it uh, very much so. That was a real problem, especially in the first version of Star. If you did, if you just opened the original instead of first making a copy of it, then you were editing the original. It looked just like editing the copy. So I don't know if we ever went to a lock later, but, but the solution sort of the HI community has come up with is the notion of stationary. And so when you double click on stationary, it does the tear off for you. And we, I don't know if we did that in Star or not. It, it doesn't really matter. Um, that would be the solution that we would adopt. Thanks, Dave. Hi, Wendy Kellogg from IBM Research. Um, I'm very taken with the idea of powerful ideas and this you know, order of magnitude, fewer commands and all of that. You didn't mention uh, the nature of the team that designed and implemented STAR. It's my belief that it was a small team of people. And I was wondering if you'd uh, comment on the role of having a focused sort of hot team and the result. That's correct. It was a team of six people did the whole design. And I was just one of the six uh, members of it. Um, we did have a lot of support teams, like we had a functional uh, user testability lab, even back then in the late 70s. And we tested, uh, we built prototypes. Uh, some of you may know about the Elto computer, which is a bitmap display screen. So we actually implemented icons. In fact, I implemented the first icons in Smalltalk on the Elto, and then we took it out and, and user tested it and all that sort of thing. Um, we were one of the first to really take the methodology seriously, the methodology of design. And we actually wrote a methodology document. And uh, then what we did is we wrote a functional specification in an object-oriented fashion. It was divided into basically three sections per concept. There was an overview of why is this facility even here, like filing or something. And then there were all the objects that would be in that concept, that domain. And then in a separate section would be all the actions that could be applied to those objects. And of course, there always had to be move, copy, delete, and show properties. And actually having that is a rigorous, um, having that is, there's certain things we insisted on. We insisted that you could do that on every object. So it was a nice, guide to the spec writer, they knew they were going to have to include sections that uh, dealt with those commands. And then it could, whatever other 
actions were appropriate were then added on. Yeah, and that guideline, um, it was a tremendous help to the implementers because now it's written down in concrete and the design uh, didn't necessarily shift too much, although it took us about five versions of the spec before we finally got it right. And, uh, Thanks very much. Okay, um, thank you. You, you have uh, the great opportunity to uh, play with this uh, star tomorrow at, at 8.30, is that right? All morning long? Dave? Oh, Eight. yes. Um, from 8.30 to 12.30, tomorrow in the next room, we'll have two stars set up and just come try it out. Form so, your own opinion. So that's the time to come get uh, to get all your detailed questions uh, answered. Uh, we're going to make a quick transition to uh, the next speakers, if anyone uh, could dare leave, they're welcome to. <laughs> um, so thank you very much.